Okay, so today I'm just going to have a quick look at, at file carving. File carving is something we use all the time. Um, and again, one case I was involved in, actually a couple of cases that has been really important. Um, one case I was involved in was a child at risk investigation. My examples. Interesting thing. Um, but it was a, a child at risk investigation where there had been accusations that the father had been abusing. Actually, the whole situation, the mothers made these accusations. I was being well upon the child there, potential child. We went in, did the search warrant, found um, a few bits and pieces. The whole time we were at the search warrant, the guy's talking to one of the police officers, the inspector who's in charge, talking about how his wife just doesn't want to see his ass. He really admires the beauty of the naked body, especially children's naked bodies. They're so much pure than every blah, 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 blah. Couldn't help noticing in the fireplace there's a bunch of burnt papers. Um, so we're going through all these computers and everything. Of course it's a Mac, one of those big iMac, the original iMac, in the back, I get a hard drive out. Um, but got that thing, got it the hard drive, couldn't find anything on his Mac. We had a bunch of CDs there, we started flicking through the CDs and we found one CD with a couple of, of suspect sites. We actually archived the whole web, kind of a weird thing to do, but it was a, a um, so the investigators decided, okay, that's enough. We're going to seize the whole lot. Took his computer, took all his CDs, and he found a sort of digital camera, grabbed the digital camera. So we go back to the police station. Um, at the time, this police station was about three hours from our office. So the boss is actually on the phone, phone at this point saying, okay, you're incurring overtime money. Get, get back. We don't want you to spend the night. That's too much overtime. Balances. Um, so we're there going through stuff. The offsider is going through a bunch of things. It's not really funny. And I just thought, okay, last thing we'll do, have a quick look at the camera card. Have a camera. All deleted. Sort of expect. Count the files on it and get pictures there of the guy actually assaulting the At which point it gets game over. Pretty damn clear it's him in the pictures. Pretty damn clear what's going on. So, pretty much case to close that. We end up confessing. Um, so, file carving is something, certainly from a criminal perspective, can be really important. That's just one little short example. Um, so, today I'm just going to have a look at, at some of the tools that are out there. Um, obviously, NCASE, SDK, XWAYS all have their own tools. Sorry guys, I'm trying to look at the audience. And look. Um, so looking at, at techniques and some of the algorithms that we can actually use. First up, what's carving? Carving wood, turkey, all sorts of different tools out there. Um, what we're talking about is carving hex data. Scanning through a bunch of, of raw hex values, looking for files that are relevant. JPEGs, which is what we've got here. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that on your computers yet. You can quite so see the JPEG header there. Um, and really, the simplest form of carving is what we call the, the header footer approach. You simply find the file signature that you're looking for, you keep searching until you find the footer of that file type, and you copy that data. Sometimes it works. In, in, that, in that case, I was telling you about, that's all the process that's needed, and we were able to of the file. Um, when we have fragmentation occurring, that process doesn't work so well. Everyone, I assume, is familiar with fragmentation. You get files written and they won't fit all in one contiguous space. They get broken over the place. So when we have fragmentation or when we have overwritten files, we need to be able to have ways of determining, OK, I'm reading this data. Yes, it's still a JPEG. Yes, it's still a JPEG. Oh. Um, and then try and put the whole thing back together, which is where things are really getting tricky. Now, before we get too carried away with all this sort of stuff, we really want to say, okay, is fragmentation a problem? How often does it actually occur in real life? Um, there's a couple of papers talking about it uh, and looking at it. This study here is 
actually came out of, um, I think one of them worked for Microsoft. Um, and here they're actually looking at a database performance um, and basically wrote and deleted a bunch of files in the file system and looked at how bad fragments were after lots of reads, um, lots of writes, and, lots of reads. Um, and basically you can see here it's sort of stabilised. Um, this is on NTFS at around about 10 fragments per file, which is a pretty high level of fragmentation. Certainly something every carbon perspective is something that is going to cause us quite a few problems. Um, Simpson Garfinkel also did a study. Um, he went out and bought a heap of hard drives off eBay and secondhand hand hard drives. Um, and then went through and actually analysed them and looked at the level of fragmentation on them. His results were a little different um, to the previous study. And what he found there, I really want to walk over and start explaining it stuff. Why isn't going to work for the online guys? Um, what he found there is that in fact less than 30 of the drives out of the total collection, 324 drives, less or 30 of those drives had um, more than 10% of the files on the hard drive. So that's, that's a pretty low number. A couple of warning signs for me, I guess points of concern in this collection, some of those drives only had three or four files on them. Some of the drives are actually wiped by sold. So some of them were, were pure data drives rather than operating systems. So you're going to get different levels the accuracy of this collection may not be the most. But certainly the volume he's got is really impressive. Um, so when you carve a, a file using the, the header footer approach, um, you're going to end up with something like what you see here on the left, where you only get half the picture. Um, that's the full picture in there. You hit the fragmentation point, and suddenly it all goes black, or you get a bunch of different colors or something. If you use the encase um, and the carving feature in encase, you see that a fair bit. We don't know exactly how encase goes about because they don't actually tell us exactly what to do. But the fact they ask for the maximum amount of cars um, makes me suspect they probably are just using and one limitation there tools. Um, so slightly more complex, slightly more advanced approaches um, is to say we find the header, we keep reading the data. If we find a new header signature, that would also indicate that we're onto a new set of data. So we'd stop reading at that point and say, OK, we have a chunk of file, but we don't know where the rest is or whether we've got to the end of it or not. Um, or if we find an allocated file. Obviously, when you're looking at an allocated space, only your space on hard drive, that's all fragmented. That's all done. So once you've hit an allocated file, um, so that works up until a point, but if you've got a fragment on the end of the start of a file, so in this example here, you've got three clusters of JPEG. JPEG 1, followed by a couple of clusters, JPEG 2 with a footer. You carve that. It's going to look, you've got the header, you've got the footer, it's all JPEG data. It's going to look like a carving tool, but it's got a complete picture, but you're still going to come up. Another consideration, um, again, just looking at JPEGs, in your EXIF data, you can have a thumbnail of the JPEG. So if you're carving the JPEG, you hit the header, then you hit the thumbnail. Are you going to end up just carving the thumbnail out of the JPEG? Or are you going to get? And what I'm getting at here is that to be effective carving, your tools actually really need to understand the file format. Um, one really interesting thing, just talking about these these thumbnails. Um, quite often, this example here, the thumbnail you can see is actually a very different picture. It's basically the unedited version of the picture that. File picture displayed. Um, there's this no spam yeah, website, um, no spam.ee forward slash on exif. He's written a, a little script that actually searches the internet looking for JPEGs where the thumbnail doesn't match the picture. Doing a little comparison there. 
find all sorts of very interesting. When you're posting pictures, be very careful if you edit out something. You don't want everyone. Um, just really briefly, I did some stuff last month on four sector um, hard drives and got a few questions on the difference between clusters and sectors. Um, really, I'm sure everyone knows this, but just I got a few questions from people that maybe didn't. The cluster is allocated by the file system. The cluster sits on top of the sectors. The sectors are allocated by the hard drive, by the physical device, and specified by the physical device. So when we're carving, um, if we're looking at, at files, so in this example here, if we're looking for header at the start of that JPEG, that should be on the cluster boundary. You're not going to find a header in the middle of the sector. It's only going to be on that cluster boundary. So straight away we can actually improve the performance of our carving process rather than searching through every single byte. We only need to be looking at the first whatever size of the signature is, looking at those first bytes at the start of the cluster. Um, if we don't know the cluster size, if we don't know what file system and everything else is being used, then we can step back down to the sector. Um, so generally sector is going to be 512 bytes and look at every 512 bytes. So um, looking at this, the whole file val validation process um, is going to be a better approach to file carving. So in file validation, the carving tool needs to know the whole format of the file. How does the file work? Then just carve out the file and it could be as simple as, okay, I'm looking for Word documents, dump out Word documents, try and open up Word. If Word generates an error, come back to the file or something else, then we can know that we haven't carved out a proper Word document. We may still have some useful data. No, it may not work. You can also use statistical analysis. Now a bunch of people have tried different approaches with statistical analysis um, and had very mixed success. Basically it doesn't seem to be at this point in time, it doesn't seem to be analyzing data or identify change in consistently. If you're going from a JPEG to a zip file, um, there's not enough difference. It's all compressed data. It's all highly random data. It's actually determining simply by looking at the frequency of bytes or whatever else you're looking at, you're not going to get a good reliable result at that point. And even after we take all these approaches, um, you do get fragmentation where the end of the file actually occurs at the beginning of the disk or in front of the disk before the start of the file. So it's not even a matter of reading the disk sequentially, pulling the data off, I find the header, therefore the rest of the file must be following it somewhere. I possibly find the header and the rest of the file is actually back at the beginning of the hard drive somewhere in front of it. Um, so in terms of tools that just use the signature header type approach, um, Encase Foremost and Scalpel <coughs> um, all use variations on this. Um, Scalpel and Foremost um, were written or sort of came about as a result of some of the DFRWS challenges. Um, and they're both, I mean, pretty good tools. Um, Encase does some work for as well. FTK and again, closed source tool, we don't know exactly what it's doing, working what algorithm or methods using carving. Um, and then quite a few people have conducted different tests. FTK version 3 actually appears to do some fairly in depth carving quite decently. Um, guys at Marshall University um, have actually written. Um, FTK3 actually lets you create your own custom card. And they appear to be working pretty good. Um, PhotoRec is a really efficient carving tool, really active. It has a bunch of information on specific file types. And the only limitation of it is it doesn't handle the out of search searches. And it only searches the cluster and search. And certainly if the open source tools out there, um, Photorec has a much higher 
are actually accurate. Oh, it's easy to validate. Rather than document. So when we're dealing with fragmentation, um, it's, it's like looking at a, a big puzzle. You've got all these pieces um, of the puzzle and you're trying to put them all back together and reassemble it. And there's a couple of tools out there. Um, one is Revit by uh, Joachim Metz. I really hope I'm getting his name right. I just British name. As good as it could be. Um, and Bas Clout. Apologies. Of um, but these guys actually wrote this tool, and again, it's written, came out of the DFRW as a challenge, and are really looking at clever ways of reassembling points where you have a bunch of fragments, uh, put them back together, working out the model, all the fragments. Um, another tool actually written by um, Nasir, Tasha, Lish, I don't know, you guys probably know them, they're all. Down the road. Um, and adroit photo forensics. So they've actually patented the algorithms. I'm not a big fan of also patents. But at the same time, you know, they've come up with a very good method. And certainly, as far as advanced recovery, um, this smart carving approach they use is really quite clever. Um, and basically, Simplified approach of looking at it, they say, okay, we've got a bunch of, of fragments. And again, their, their approach only works with certain limited types of picture files. Um, approach is we have a bunch of fragments, files, let's just stick them together. Do they fit? Do the pictures all match together? Yes or no? If they do, save that fragment. They also assume at this point that each fragment is only going to be used once, one file, used once. One piece, then you're good to go and you move on. And try and put them all in. There we go, we have a better fit. Put it back there, and we end up reassembling everything it should be. Um, looking at specific file types, Michael Cohen, um, fellow Australian, now working for Google. Again, for the DFRWS challenge. Wrote some really advanced carvers PDF and for the for both of these, again, he's relying on extensive understanding of that PDF file. Cover them all. With the PDF stuff, he's identified. Okay, we have the header, we have some data, we have the directory. The directory ends up pointing to each individual compressed file within the zip package. Identifying those individual files, matching directory, and read. And if you have a look at his tools, both these tools are open source. Um, they're out there. They are certainly extremely effective at recovering the zip and your PDF. And then Simpson Garfinkel um, has extended on that a bit more and gone to the extent of actually finding the file headers and recreating. He doesn't even need to find the original header for the zip file, he's just finding the file headers and recreating the header so you can actually unpack the files, which is a really good approach, um, really clever approach. That's something that's incorporated into Office Extractor. I don't know if you guys have used it. I actually got convinced um, talking to intelligence people, talking about the wonders of Office Extractor. Intelligence people, normally in, in forensics, taking a fairly targeted approach. You know what you're looking for. And you're looking for the evidence. You have time frame. Bulk extractor is dumping everything out on the disk, and then you're going through and passing it. Um, from an intelligence perspective, quite often it's getting hard to where they have no idea what bulk extractor is actually doing. Approach for them, getting everything. Now, when we look at performance comparisons between the different tools, um, things really start to get interesting. And what we have here is a number of invalid files are actually covered by the different tools. Um, 
So this test um, was done by Nasir on the Adroit website. So obviously pointing out how wonderful their tool is. Um, but they were using a, a valid data set. You can see here, um, say so Photorec found 76 files or 76 JPEGs, 7 GIFs, 13 JPEGs, but only had one invalid file. The rest of the out was invalid. Whereas your FTK, ProDiscover, all pulled out just the same files, but also had a lot of invalid ones. With the exception of FTK3, which has actually done a really good job covering that data. Um, and Bas Clow, also his master's thesis, also good out there. Well, have that. Um, looking at again the, the carving recall, so the ability to cover files, vision, how accurately, how many files it finds, how many false positives it ends up with. Um, you can see here Photorec. So on where the file system is known, Photorec and Revit taking advantage of the knowledge of the file system are able to recover very nearly perfectly everything. Compared to tools like Scaffold, FTK and everything else, which have various degrees of success. You notice that FTK3 also has a pretty reasonable result. When there is no file system, no information about the file system is available, the data is actually been manually created, be formatted all over the place, you get very different results. Photorec and Revit are still very much up there, and the other tools are all a fair way behind. There's a bunch of other tools that use carving out there. Um, JAD have Internet Evidence Finder. I've well, carbon allocated for you with web browser artifacts and analysis. Files can be cropped out with PFF, with alpha emails. In actually within, so at this point in time, they're actually carving within PFF. Um, so, one I guess key takeaway from this open source tools, um, certainly Photorec is certainly the tool you should be using. Well, it's called Photorec, Photo Recover. Volume, file formats it supports is huge, um, and it, it's a really good, useful tool. It's certainly far superior to any of the commercial tools out there, um, with the exception of Adroit when carving picture files. Photorec actually do word documents containers. Um, and the other thing, this this is one area where I really think we need to be looking to the vendors to be giving us a lot more information about how to operate. Um, in my opinion, most fields in forensics we don't actually have a need for this error measurement. You look at the Dalbert criteria, one of the key measures is, is it a science? Is do you have error? Can you tell me what the error rate is for whatever test? In most cases, I'm copying a hard drive. I'm copying all the data from it, it's either a perfect copy or it's not. For the most part, we don't use it. There is no error rate. We can prove this copy is identical to that copy. When we're doing things like file carving, there is very much a potential for error rates. We can see here you've got a bunch of different applications all using different methods for carving, all with different levels of accuracy, levels of precision. So it's really important that we actually know what's going on. And that's something that I really think we need to work on. And that's it from me. So um, thanks for having me. Thanks for everyone online for turning up and sitting through that. And um, if you have any questions, Carving for oh, carving through PCAPs. Um, carving through PCAPs is actually much easier because you don't get the fragmentation. Um, sorry, let me rephrase that. Carving TCP, you don't get any fragmentation. Carving UDP, it's going to depend on what it's actually carrying in that. Um, but for the most part, you're not going to be getting the same level of fragmentation problems. Um, you can use 
Wireshark to quickly dump, to dump out the contents of all that traffic, a raw blob if you want. For the most part, the TCP dump really supports so many protocols. I would be surprised if you actually need carbon. I don't know, I mean, you need to carve. Have you had a need? Yeah. Do you want to give me an example? Right. So they were actually streaming traffic through the sandbox. Right. Okay. Um, right, and, and you can just dump them out using Wireshark or something. All the traffic. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. So photo rec isn't really going to work with that. It's not a file system. And in fact, if you think about it, the um, Offsets are actually going to be all wrong. It would actually mess up Java. All that space, you're talking 15,000, 1,500 bytes per frame. So if you, you're not going to be getting a 512 offset, where you're going to find your headers and everything. Tools, you're going to want a tool that actually looks at everything. You're not going to want a tool. Is that calf? Yeah, but see, yeah, so it reassembles and, and pulls the files out of the, the traffic itself. Um, sorry, guys, we just had a suggestion that you can use network carver, a uh, network miner, sorry, for carving. <laughs> um, <laughs> very good, yes. Leader. We just had the question, can you carve PCAPs um, or is it a good tool for carving network traffic? Um, my suggestion was, was um, TCP dump will actually pull a lot of that information out for you. You can reassemble the traffic and pull it out. Um, another suggestion was network miner. You can also do that. I'm curious if anyone online carves PCAPs or network captures. I think Blade will do byte by byte. So I think I've used it before on large files and trying to stuff in them. Cool, good stuff. Another tool to check out, guys. That Blade. Okay, any more questions, comments? Or just let me get out of here. It's all too boring. Okay. Um, nothing. Nothing else? Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. And um, we'll, I guess, see you all online next month, I hope. Catch you later. <laughs>